Well, the Anton Anfalov has interviewed hundreds of Russian and Ukrainian insiders. He has taught at various universities in the Soviet Union in Ukraine. He has done research on underground civilizations throughout Russia, and he is also very knowledgeable about a secret space program built by the Russian Federation. You are listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. Well, welcome, Anton, to Exopolitics Today again. It's great pleasure and big honor to talk to you every time, Dr. Sala. Yes, yes. Well, uh, it is very good. Um, you can call me Michael, uh, otherwise I'll have to call you Dr. Anfalov. Uh, so wh whatever, uh, whatever works. Uh, I think uh, your background is really fascinating because I, I know you're an expert on uh, the UFO reports in the Soviet Union. And these, this goes all the way back to the Second World War. So there, there were a lot of rumors about Nazi Germany having developed flying saucer projects during the Second World War and, and the Soviets learning about that and incorporating a lot of that. So I want to get you to tell us a little bit about that history. So why don't we begin by uh, you just telling us, what, what do you know about the Nazi uh, flying saucer program that was underway during the Second World War? Yeah, Michael. At first, I was very skeptical about that. I thought, oh, maybe all of that are fairy tales, false rumors, and people exaggerate and people create new mythology. And one of the Russian UFO researchers even wrote a peculiar amazing book called The Death of Fascist UFOs, <laughs> proclaiming that all of that is just big nonsense. And in many articles and uh, <clears throat> in the internet, and many books you can read that all of that are fairy tales and nonsense and this subject does not exist. But when I started my research, digging deeply into this amazing subject, that was a real revelation to me because amazingly I learned that these rumors are based on solid facts and there are many <clears throat> reliable observations and uh, reliable witnesses in many countries uh, testifying and mm, the truth and in favor of that that Nazi UFOs were real and are real because the Fourth Reich, Reich exists apparently even today in hidden form, and at least it existed at the end of the previous century for sure, because we have many reports from Australia, from Norway, from Britain, even from United States worldwide of this strange, uh, definitely Earth-made uh, objects, and not only flying saucers, not only disks, but also cigar-shaped or loaf-shaped, uh, like elongated pieces of bread, you know, loaf. So they were also observed and rocket shaped and also ghost rockets over Sweden and Scandinavian countries and also over Greece in 1946 and in many other locations, including the Soviet Union, also strange objects were observed in many places. And <clears throat> This technology evidently survived the World War and was developed later and advanced. And what we have now, we have this branch of these people that are involved in these covered projects, so-called black projects or USAP, Unacknowledged Special Access 
programs or projects. And amazingly, I learned that the Nazi Germany also had its black projects, like the US has now black projects. So as people say, once you become black, you never come back. So they are off records. I'm amazed by some naive people who are trying to learn history of this, uh, digging into archives and trying to unravel some documentation. How can you possibly do that? that Many of these operations are off books, off records, and you can't find uh, sometimes the proofs, but the testimonies are there. A lot of people saw this uh, craft and this amazing technology. So oh. I'm no I more skeptical about that anymore. Oh, that's good to know. Now, I, I recall that uh, around 1991, there was a Bulgarian researcher by the name of Vladimir Tuzitsky, who says that he gained access to a bunch of uh, former Nazi SS documents that had uh, been released as a result of the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, that these documents suddenly uh, became available and were sold to the highest bidder. And so uh, one of the documents that he showed in lectures he, at the time was uh, a document uh, an SS document that showed the production of different types of flying saucer craft. Uh, so uh, some of these craft, one of the craft was the Vril craft, and uh, the other, there were three types of Hannibal craft. Can you put that image up, Jazz? Shows, that shows uh, these uh, different types of flying saucers that the Nazi SS uh, had had developed and it shows you how number how many tests there were how many craft were built and it also showed you the propulsion device so i don't know if you have you seen this document well what do you think is it real or what yes absolutely i saw all of that evidence and documentation and i studied and saw much more and i studied a lot of books and sources about that so I prefer to be cautious and uh, to carefully estimate that evidence because <clears throat> from first look, we see that many photographs of the so-called German Nazi disc-shaped objects are blurry. So many are not clear, and some are definitely fakes and the work of, you know, uh, hoaxers to imitate the reality. But on the other hand, we have multiple reports and uh, evidence in favor that such programs did really exist in Nazi Germany. So what I believe is we must consider the possibility that some documents were created with the purpose to distract attention from the real projects or to muddy waters, as we can say. Uh, so don't trust every document about that and don't trust every photograph. But uh, together with that, there's a real core inside this subject. And definitely Germans did create multiple disc-shaped objects, not just three models, many more. And they started with small models for one pilot with small cockpit. And then gradual development, uh, developing these models and the types of craft. And in 1943, they were already able to manufacture big discs uh, approximately 100 feet or, uh, meters in diameter, maybe, uh, uh, sorry, 100 feet in diameter, 85 feet approximately, big, really big disks. So, and there's multiple evidence and reports, and uh, for example, from 1944, from good alt Golson, 
This is location south of Berlin, where the Polish uh, member, uh, Polish man who was uh, there working for Germans, he saw this big flying saucer behind the tarp wall created on this place. What I believe is that this disc made emergency landing there, and the SAS arrived and created this big wall to cover it up and to um, cover the scene to prevent an authorized access. And while it was repairing, uh, it was uh, the scene of this accident that this Polish man saw that and later when he appeared in States, he told his story to FBI. So we have that documentation that is reported by solid men and uh, this is solid evidence. So we can't deny everything. But when people rely upon only one source, like Vladimir Terzitsky, that's not good quality research. I prefer to rely upon multiple sources to compare them and to make my outcomes only after detailed and deep study of all evidence that we have. So I believe that there's a big core of truth within that. But uh, you can't take everything literally. Maybe in some cases, we have to be careful and vigilant about all these uh, photos, documents, and uh, other stuff, because some papers are easy to fake, to make hoaxes. And hoaxes are multiple. We must admit that and be careful. I know William Tompkins, who says that he was uh, part of a Navy espionage program during uh, World War II, says that the Navy spies reported that the, the Germans were working on as many as, I think he said, 38 different prototypes. So they had different models of these anti-gravity craft, different shapes, as you were describing, flying saucers, cigar-shaped and uh, triangle-shaped, flying wing-shaped. They were working on 38 different models. Um, and so so you, you, how accurate do you think that was, that number? I believe this is the truth or very close to the truth because definitely I can state that Germans created competition between different designers. They wanted uh, to progress rapidly. So good competition and the spirit of good competition is always promoting every research and production and research and development. So they created this atmosphere of competition between different designers and different engineers in Nazi Germany and also Italian engineers who were involved in this project. So I mean that apparently this is the truth or very close to the truth. If you count all different projects like Horton to, to nine or like this wing shaped aircraft and traditional engines and not just electromagnetic engines, we can find multiple projects indeed and the evidence is overwhelming, despite some guys were uh, making up this stuff. Uh, some stuff is definitely made up by some creative minds, but anywhere we have this evidence. And that's true uh, to state that competition did exist in Nazi Germany in these multiple projects. And that's for sure. When you want to create something fast, you have to create competition. You have to create the spirit and to do this as fast as, they, as you can, because Germany was losing the war. They needed this desperately. So that was the atmosphere at that time in early 40s. And definitely, I believe so. Well, I know that um, there were many German companies that were working on these flying saucer projects. 
um, in addition to conventional fighter aircraft like the Messerschmitt uh, Corporation. But one of the corporations that you sent me information on that I was surprised was uh, the Saab uh, Corporation, because that's a Swedish corporation. And you said that they were also helping the Nazi flying saucer programs. And that's surprising because uh, Sweden was a neutral country during the Second World War. So even though they were neutral, they, they the Swedish companies like Saab were involved in this high-tech uh, German reverse engineering of, um, of these flying saucer craft. So you want to tell us about Saab and its involvement? Yeah, sure. Um, because when you study this deeply, you'll find that Sweden wasn't that neutral as people believe. First of all, the iron ore that Nazi Germany was getting, it was transported through Sweden from the port of Narvik in Norway uh, across the territory of Sweden. And uh, it was uh, in that direction also they had this transportation across northern Sweden. And why Saab was involved? Because Germany was hiding its secret submarines, the Project 11B, the Black Knight of the Schwarzritter. Uh, they built four submarines, U112, U113, U114, and U115. 115. So in top secrecy, off records, off books, and they were hiding at least one of such submarines in Sweden in 1945, as I learned during my investigation, and others were hidden in the neutral ports of other countries like Vigo Bay in Spain, like in Port Portugal, and uh, they were making uh, trips to South America and to different secret bases. And why SAP was involved? Because Sweden was associated with the Nazi Germany through the Wallenberg family. Uh, Jacob Wallenberg was <clears throat> had close connections with Nazis. And Wallenberg family, that's the famous family that has Saab company, and Saab company is very remarkable because it has both aircraft production and submarine production. That both thinks that Nazi Germany was involved in uh, dealing with the black projects. I mean, German black projects were uh, in this both fields, secret aircraft and secret submarines and <clears throat> using this technology. So Jacob Wallenberg was involved and SEB Bank was definitely involved. We can learn that even from Wikipedia, from public sources. Stockholm's and Skilda Bank had operations with Nazis and with Nazi money. And when the defeat of Nazi Germany was inevitable and everybody understood that inevitable, inevitable outcome, the operations began to transfer all basic assets, resources, money, gold to neutral countries like Sweden, like Spain, like Turkey, many Latin uh, South American countries as well, all across the world where they could hide their assets and secret technologies as well. So I believe SAP was involved because of that. And also <clears throat> it was another route for some Germans to escape from Nazi Germany of some war criminals. And I believe that Heinrich Himmler escaped from Nazi Germany in May of 1945 through Sweden. And we can also learn about that in some historic documentation. And I'm sure and I did my deep, long, detailed research because I'm historian myself. I graduated from university with a degree in history, five years, all A marks and red diploma I got. So I'm responsible for my words and I'm very careful as about historical facts. 
and about historical proofs, and I know what science in history means because I'm a historian. I'm myself is university degree in history because my second degree is in economics and my first degree is history degree. So Saab was definitely involved. And the most interesting that Saab had underground aviation plant, the whole factory hidden beneath the surface, underneath in Lynn Chopping, the city of Lynn Chopping, southeast of, of Stockholm. Amazingly, there still is, but now it is closed, underground aviation plant. And they have the biggest escalator to the center under the ground in the whole Sweden there. That's amazing. And now it's mostly declassified because this plant was closed at the end of the Cold War. But just imagine, guys, during all those years, from 1940s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and early 90s, it was active, it was operational, it was involved in different projects of Saab. And this is corporate secret of Saab. This is private company and Wallenberg's on it and they protect their assets and uh, corporate uh, secrets, definitely. I want to ask you about that uh, because um, the kind of like the understanding that a lot of people have about uh, deep underground military bases or these secret bases is that these are run by by militaries like the U.S. military or maybe the Russian military. But what you're saying is that uh, these families like the Wallenberg families and other prominent families in Europe yes. actually yeah. uh, got a lot of these resources from the Germans and built these yes. vast underground complexes and they were doing their own um, extraterrestrial technology projects and they were also uh, making contact or learning about like the Agatha underground network. So you want to tell yeah. us about that? Yes, definitely, because I learned that there is indeed huge Agartha network on this planet. And Nazi SS was obsessed with that. And specifically, the chief of Nazi SS, Heinrich Himmler, was obsessed with that. That was his obsession to find underground worlds, these tunnels, and uh, to find advanced technologies there. And that's what they did, because they were digging everywhere, just everywhere, even in Crimea, when they occupied the big territory of the Soviet Union. They were digging deeply in Crimean Peninsula, in Russia, in Ukraine, and all over the world, in Turkey, in Greenland, in Scandinavia, all over Europe they could get. They were digging and studying caves, the speleology. They had experts. They had the whole institute, an Anerbe Institute, which was subordinated to Himmler and to SS. And what I learned is that they did found some fragments of this underground network under Germany and also underground passages leading from northern Germany to Denmark and eventually to Sweden. And then under the Sweden as well, under Swedish territory and under Norway. And there are even passages that go from Russia to Finland and to Sweden and to Norway, interconnecting passages. That's huge network. Also under Poland, under Czechoslovakia, under Czech Republic, under Slovakia, and uh, many other countries, Austria. So then they used fragments of this network Algarta network they could use also for secret transportation. And that's the route that Himmler apparently used to escape from Germany and replace himself by the double, because the official history is false. That amazingly, I learned 
those facts just recently, digging deeply as a historian myself, I'm extremely e interested in this history because I was specialized in modern and novel history in the university. And all my um, works and my diploma was also, also dedicated to the newest novel history. So I am extremely interested as a historian in that. And I don't have doubts that they found something because it's, it's impossible they weren't able to find anything because of great resources involved and great efforts to dig deeply. So I know for sure they, uh, there are underground passages there and the Europe, and they learned about them definitely. Yes, I think that's a very important point in terms of understanding uh, the role major corporations and industrialists play in the development of secret space programs, that it's not necessarily run by militaries, but it's also these, these families or these uh, bloodline families uh, or the black nobility, I think, as some people talk about them. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the U-boats, the submarines that were used by Nazi Germany. I mean, according to official historians, uh, the Nazis developed uh, these kind of like attack submarines, U-boats, to attack Allied shipping during the Second World War. They created many of these, uh, but they didn't have really big ones. But according to... Uh, some sources, the, the Germans or the Nazis developed really big transportation submarines that they could take a lot of equipment uh, long distances and that they used these submarines to build uh, underground bases in Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Norway and even Antarctica. So you want to tell us what was really going on with the German submarine fleet? Yeah, absolutely. I studied that in details, and I am very attentive to details like Sherlock Holmes and with his investigations of all crimes. And so now you can find very detailed information and good references about just every German you bought uh, and good databases you can find in the internet and a lot of documentation. But what I have learned is that Germans did indeed construct uh, these huge submarines of the type 11B. 11 uh, is by Roman letters, no, uh, figures, numbers, not by Arabic ones. And these submarines were indeed in project, in drafts, in uh, blueprints, and uh, they were really huge. The biggest German submarines, 115 meters long or 377 feet long. That's amazing, that's the biggest uh, size, but officially they were never commissioned to Kriegsmarine, to the German Navy. So people can ask why, because they were built in top secrecy. And I firmly believe that was the real black project of the Nazi Germany, the so-called Black Knight or Der Schwarz Ritter. And they were huge cargo transport submarines. And for sure, uh, I believe they constructed four of them. And one of them was lost apparently near Cape Cod, Massachusetts, USA in 1944, but the rest three were operational. And as far as I understand, they redesigned the original project because Kriegsmarine, the German Navy didn't uh, want them at all. They said, we don't need them, they're too large, they're too slow, and we can't use them for good uh, traps, wolf packs, and for sea battles. But anyway, they were used by another organization, apparently by SS and by Abwehr, the German intelligence, and uh, the money of big 
German industrialists, and maybe not only German, uh, big capitalists were used to finance this project by unofficial channels of books, of records. So when Kriegsmarine says that we don't know anything about them, that's true, because they have nothing to do with Kriegsmarine officially, Project 11B. It's the real black project. And anyway, I found evidence and based on the research by one known German historian of the U boat fleet that they were indeed tests on the river, river weather when this type was tested and it got speed of 26 knots on surface. And how that could be? if officially this project, di project did never exist. One can ask, and I wonder. So it's as highly likely, I suppose, that they build them in total secrecy, off books, off records, and they immediately took them away to hide them in secret bases, in, in neutral countries, in Spain, and in Sweden. And in some remote bases like Fuerteventura base under Canary Islands uh, near Spain and Atlantic Ocean, the so-called Casa Winter uh, base, uh, Gustav Winter was the owner of this uh, facility above on top, this villa, and underneath there was big base for three submarines and three panels and two of them were occupied by all submarines when divers from Spain accidentally stumbled upon it in early 80s, approximately in 1984 or 83. They penetrated there and amazing. Two old submarines were still there uh, and they found maps of the South America in one of them. They could penetrate in one. Uh, the hatches were locked. They couldn't open hatches of the first submarine, but the second, they could open and penetrate inside. That was amazing. South American maps. So, and other bases were also used. But this sub 11B project, they were never based together with the rest. German fleet, because that could expose this black project. But together with that, I believe that other submarines from the official, this time official, Kriegsmarine, were transferred to the secret submarine fleet as well, like U-116, that was lost without trace in 1942 in mid-Atlantic. What happened? It was big mine layer, huge submarines. The next in sequence, so from U-112, 113, 114, 115, and oops, boom, the next submarine disappears in mid-Atlantic in 1942. What happened? The huge submarine as well. It was very good submarine to transport a lot of stuff. And I'm sure they redesigned them and uh, they added cargo containers uh, mounted atop on the outer hull so they could move a lot because an original, original project 11B, it was a hydroplane, a rado mounted atop and they could use this plane from the submarine. And in the redesigned version, they used this huge cargo containers. And uh, that's the real picture as far as I see it. And also other submarines of the regular fleet were also used in top secrecy and even equipped with some brand new, brand new and top secret designs like deflecting attacking aircrafts like electromagnetic gen generators and things like that. That's amazing. For example, U-234, as I learned, was equipped with this electromagnetic generator that could deflect all attacking aircraft in the radius of 3,300 yards distant. So it could 
they could never s s destroy the submarine. All attacking British and American aircraft, and it passed through Dutch stra straits. Okay, with no damage, unlike many other submarines that were sank there. It was extremely scary to pass through the Dutch straits. Uh, at the end of the war. But say submarines like U-234 and U-977 succeeded to do this. That's amazing. I, I thought there was a very important uh, document that was released. Uh, it's called the Red House Report. It's from a meeting, a secret meeting involving uh, leading German industrialists and some uh, Nazi SS officials uh, uh, that were there uh, representing Heinrich Himmler, and the the orders was given to to move a lot of uh, Nazi Germany's uh, wealth and assets and technologies out of Germany because they understood that the war was lost. So this was held on August 10 in Strasbourg, uh, well France now, and and so that really is a document that shows that what you just said really did happen that there was this massive outflow of not only of finances but also technologies and submarines carrying all this wealth and scientists and all of the technologies out of germany nazi germany to these neutral countries that you just described so i think that doc so have you heard of the red house report um, not yet, but I'm studying this. But anyway, I can confirm that Germany lost the war already in 1941 when the mortal decision was made to attack the Soviet Union, the so-called Barbarossa Plan or Directive Number 40. And that was suicide. That was our estimation of the power of the Nazi Germany. And from that moment, it was doomed. And uh, people, wise people realized the true picture for sure long before 1945. It was evident in 1942 after Stalingrad. It was absolutely evident in 1943 after battle near Kursk in Russia. It was doomed. So uh, 1943 was the year of intense bombing by allies of the German territory. So this evacuation definitely started long before. And they had enough time to construct bases outside Germany to move money, gold, values, so all they had, and to invest that to different banks, to corrupt important people, to organize bribes, to do all they wanted to create auxiliary and bases and to remove all valuable assets because wise people understood that quite well and long before German defeat. So absolutely, that's true. And multiple evidence uh, confirms that. And they use different organizations worldwide, like Sofindos, Societe, uh, Spanish organization to remove money, different banks, different countries. That was huge project, multinational. And that's why this Nazi international was created like giant octopus, like the spider network around the globe in different countries. So when we talk about Germans in Antarctica only, that's uh, not the true picture, it's not complete picture. It's much more difficult, I believe, and much more uh, sophisticated with many ramifications worldwide. That's a clear picture as far as I see it as a professional historian. Now, I know uh, many people in the United States and Western countries know about Operation Paperclip and that a lot of German scientists and technologies were brought into the United States uh, after World War II. But uh, not so many people know about the, the Soviet uh, equivalent that the Soviets also had a program where they brought in all of the uh, German scientists and the advanced aerospace technologies that the Germans were working on. Uh, so what what do you know of 
the, the, the kind of technologies and the scientists that the Soviet Union were able to find and bring into the United, bring into the Soviet Union uh, from these top secret locations like the Prague Skoda Works and uh, also places in uh, Poland where the Germans had all of their underground top secret projects. Yes, uh, many documents about that are now declassified. Uh, and Soviet Union moved as much as was it was possible to move out from Germany and uh, to Eastern Germany, which was DDR or Deutsch German Democratic Republic, occupied by Soviets. But mostly um, it's about aviation. German experts were moved to such locations as uh, Gorodomla Island on Lake Seliger in Kalinin region. It's now Tver region northwest of Moscow and also to Dubna, the city of Dubna, which was at that time the hamlet of Podberezia and plant number 30 where a lot of German aviation experts were also removed and they were even constructing uh, aircraft uh, for the Soviet Union and other locations as well, like Kuybyshev now, Samara. And one of the most interesting locations is, is Gorodomlia Island, because just imagine this secluded island uh, positioned amid the lake amid the dense forests deep inside Russia and uh, isolated by nature. So this is good for secret location. And uh, this is now Solnichny uh, restricted territorial uh, organization involved in the space complex and the production of hyroscopes. And that's, that is official information. And uh, I'm not telling you anything secret. You can find this on the internet. Anyway, it was also the big program in the Soviet Union to remove all Germans. However, if we talk about Prague, it was too late. When Soviet troops arrived to Prague, uh, Germans already evacuated all important assets and the flying saucer program was evacuated. Already in 1943, 44, they did this. They took entire plant, mounted everything on railway, and the whole train moved away and delivered everything to another location. And they had multiple projects in Bohemia, Moravia, on the territory of Poland, uh, Western Poland, and Czech Republic, and not only in Prague, in, in Prague at Gbele Airfield, they had also the Flying Saucer project. And one of hangers there was definitely hiding this evidence, but uh, they removed everything. But however, in 1945, Soviet, uh, Soviets uh, recovered the wreckage of the crashed German UFO because amazingly, that was so bare face, that was, was so bold from Germans to fly even when the territory was already occupied. But they had secret um, bases and secret storage of this valuable, highly valuable fuel, mercury base, the amalgam of mercury with radioactive isotopes. And the storage facility was still there in Western Poland. And that the secret missions were to fly there under the very nose of Russians to retrieve these remnants of this highly valuable fuel. And during one of these missions, one of the German flying saucers with a crew of two SS um, pilots dressed in black uniforms crashed in Poland in June of 1945 near the village of Ustka. Uh, uh, Vitovna, also the exact place near the town of Ustka in northwestern Poland. 
and uh, Soviets retrieved it, but it exploded during studies, and it was a big disaster, and several men were killed, not only Russian researchers, but Polish researchers as well. Anyway, uh, components of this disk shape uh, remained, and were retrieved and moved to Borne Solinova base, Soviet base in Poland, and then to the Soviet Union, and also, amazingly, in modern Russia, in the year 2003, uh, near the former German town of Konigsberg, which is now Kaliningrad, this is the most western tip of Russia, near the Baltic Sea. They recovered all German flying saucer accidentally, stumbled upon it in a sand pit. The boys were playing there, and they, you know, sand it's such substance that can collapse easily. And under this huge heap of sand, this boy stumbled upon a very strange device, and it appeared as an old German flying saucer. And the Russian authorities removed it in top secrecy and studied it, and this information was never published anywhere. So that's a recent discovery. But it wasn't a brand design, I mean, uh, top uh, high-tech design. Because Germans also had different uh, engines and also uh, jet engines were used in some models of line saucers that were backward projects. The most advanced are dealing with electromagnetic devices and engines and mercury fuel and uh, the devices that are very close to the original ufos that sas tank has is symbiont underground and space terrestrial non-human civilization on this planet where ancient one so uh, that's the story but uh, just imagine the big gap in technology that was huge gap between even the nazi all Nazi Germany and Soviet Union in 1980s, because in 1982, Soviet Union tried to reconstruct the vacuum mercury fuel uh, design of the UFO, so to say, and they wanted to use this design as an interceptor, as a high speed, very fast uh, interceptor to replace maybe some mix like Foxbat, MiG-25, uh, because it was very fast. It could zoom in a blink of eye, like, oops, and it's there. Boom! Immediately, it was gaining altitude. Such speed was impossible and still impossible to every jet fighter. Even the most modern models like MiG-31, Foxhound, like, you know, brand new models, it was much faster. However, Soviet Union in 19. 82 uh, encountered huge technical problems connected with this hyroscope eff effects effects uh, that influences the very design it was malfunctioning and they had huge technical problems in control systems unlike germans in the 40s just imagine this technological gap between 1980s yeah, and 1940s. So I want to ask you about that technological gap because we, we know that the uh, Nazis were able to take out their most advanced technologies, their, their successful prototypes out of Europe before the end of the Second World War. The, the Soviet Union, the Americans, they recovered a lot of the uh, unsuccessful or the crashed prototypes. So the, the Nazis took these to neutral countries, took them to South America, took them to Antarctica. And, uh, and, and then we have in uh, 1946, 1947, Operation High Jump. And, and so the US Navy goes down there to try and take over or find the, uh, the German base. 
and there was a there was a, a battle there. So what what do you know about that um, alleged battle in um, or Project High Jump and the battle between the U.S. Navy and the uh, submarine or the uh, flying saucer fleets in Antarctica that were German? Yeah, my point is in big contradiction with a popular point of view. You would be amazed uh, about my uh, opinion. It's very different. I believe this, this is huge exaggeration because this high jump expedition had 11 journalists on board. Uh, it was well reported and well documented and a lot of witnesses and you can't hide event of such scale when there are so many witnesses. And I believe that's not the case what really happened there. I believe in quite different story that contradicts the popular version of those events and widely um, reported everywhere. It's now popular belief uh, and even Farsight Institute also promoted this because these remote viewers described this battle. I know that, I saw all that and I know what people think and what people publish about that and uh, they decided that that was the case. But I don't think that was the case as a historian deeply studying that. I believe that was a sideshow or distraction to distract attention and to mislead researchers from the truth. Uh, I don't think they had such technical capabilities because just imagine, in 1945, Soviet troops that occupied Poland tried desperately to shoot down German UFOs flying there over Poland in 1945, even after defeat of the Nazi Germany. They couldn't do anything. And the American aviation and the fighter scrambled in 1952, couldn't do anything as well with his flying saucers over Washington, D.C. They were helpless. The, the Germans terrorized the American capital in 1952. Just imagine what could this small group of propelled uh, all the aircraft with assault propellers do this with this advanced flying saucers. That is not the case, I believe. Also, I believe from the official documentation and um, a lot of scientific research works that uh, indeed this high jump expedition was aimed uh, to the South Pole because America didn't want to provoke Soviet Union and to organize a, such huge maneuvers in Arctic region uh, to create a necessary stir and to annoy the Soviet Union and Stalin because the war just ended. They needed the remote area to train. And the main threat for the US in the 40s was the Soviet Union, because Soviet Union had bombers like 2-4, uh, Soviet counterpart of American B-29 flying fortress, and they were using them at those years and the only mean to deliver nuclear weapons to the US was aviation. And the shortest way to attack US was over the Northern Pole, over Arctic region. And that's the main enemy the US was scared about in the post-Cold War, especially after Winston Churchill declared the Cold War in his Fulton speech in 1946. So the real story about the fourth Reich and the hidden basis of the third Reich is not that simple as the 
in this location uh, in Antarctica. And I believe firmly that Antarctica really has huge secrets inside, indeed because that's a very remote place and very desolate with very few populations. It's a good place to hide a lot of things. I believe not only in UFO bases here, but the whole plants, the whole industrial enterprises, the whole infrastructure under ISIS, uh, I firmly believe so, but all of that belongs to sustain. Symbion, underground and space, terrestrial, non-human civilization. And what do you have to understand that the Fourth Reich, the Nazi Germany, and this SS controlled uh, piece of pipe was just part of this huge system that is controlled by aliens, by uh, this symbion underground and space terrestrial, non-human civilization. You can call them extraterrestrials, but what does the word extra means? Extra means uh, somewhere in the different space that we live. And we humans don't have situational, proper situational awareness. What we occupy is just surface of this planet, just the planet, just surface. Just imagine what we possess. They let us to live only here, only on the surface. And what they possess, they control underwater spaces, oceans, seas. They control bowels of the earth, all underground spaces, and they control space. And this craft, uh, this UFO, they can fly underwater, they can move with huge speeds and plasma envelopes, and in space, and under the ground, and everywhere. And what we have with just surface dwellers, like reservation. We are in reservation, guys, because ours is only surface, and they let us possess only to create only surface and to create all our entire civilization is very vulnerable because it is surface based. I just want to um, clarify something there. So uh, you, you mentioned uh, SUSTENC, which stands for Symbiont Underground and Space Terrestrial Non-Human Civilization. We discussed that in our last interviews. And just to remind people, uh, that re that actually refers to this kind of extensive underground civilization that involves these inner Earth kind of uh, non-human looking beings as well as compliant uh, humans and and so you're saying that in in Antarctica that that the what what's existing there is an underground base that is part of this sustec system that you've been describing that that the Nazis went with, when they went to Antarctica or to South America that they didn't just go and establish their own thing they kind of went in there and integrated with this already existing sustenc world global underground civilization is that pretty much what you're trying to say here yes i'm firm in my opinion that technically it wasn't uh, possible for germans solely exclusively to create this basis under the ground especially in remote places like antarctica greenland and other locations as well in south america and maybe in africa as well and also Solomon Islands, northeast of Australia. That's another location where Sustan has its uh, infrastructure. And I don't say that only base in Antarctica, I say the network of bases and not just bases, the whole infrastructure. It means workshops, plants, um, factories, different warehouses, underground cities with all necessary and isolates its habitats and um, production plants of various kind. So, so everything you need to survive is there. And not only there, they transferred a lot 
of their technologies to our moon. Our moon serves as a main industrial center, main spaceport in our solar system with a lot of mining, helium-3, titanium from alminite, um, and uh, thorium as well for reactors they use. And they use different energy systems and thorium based and um, free energy based and other stuff and mercury based engines a lot of different systems because they also have competition inside like different hives like different ant hills um, different habitats and this uh, civilization is like a piece of big pie with many levels in it so if you imagine just this big pyramid structured like a big pie that's it and uh, this hierarchy is subordinated with a lot of uh, different locations on earth inside our earth in oceans on the moon in the solar system and in space not only underground but in space as well so we are not dealing with only one base in Antarctica. We are dealing with a huge structure. And we are only minor part on surface on this planet. We still don't know about huge things that exist under us. The whole plants processing sea uh, water and oceanic water to extract boron. They need boron for their needs, a lot of boron. Bill Your House told about that, and also Albert K. Bender in 1953 told about that. They need this extraction from water, oceanic waters, and they also extract monazite sands, such um, specific particular black sands, highly radioactive, that you can find in many places of our world. So they attract you, false like honey, uh, like flowers attract bees, you know, and like honey attract attract bees that monocyte black sands very necessary to obtain thorium and rare earth elements for uh, the technical needs of this fast and highly advanced and highly sophisticated civilization with a lot of ramifications. We humans are quite primitive to even comprehend how difficult it is, how complicated it is, because it has a lot of ramifications. And they created the whole industry of not only UFO construction and uh, also in genetic engineering, the whole industry to construct biological beings, a very uh, unknown fact to human populations. Uh, the term EB, extraterrestrial biological entity, very popular, it's not uh, true. It's it, uh, only in the documents released to the public. And the real acronym to this is BFAB. BFAB means bipedal entity functioning as alien biological symbiont. Just imagine. And those creatures were grays with white greater skin that were found in 1947 after two crashes in New Mexico. On April 14, 1947, in western New Mexico, close to the Arizona border, not in Roswell, but on San Agustin Plains and uh, close to Arizona Horse Mesa there, two crash locations in western New Mexico, eight bodies. Eight bodies were studied in 1947 in Wright Patterson AFB and uh, in S4 since 1971 when it was completed, three years of construction. And they were just, to, just, to, just to clarify here, I mean, you're, you're saying that those bodies that were recovered um, in these different crash locations in the United States and 
uh, elsewhere, that these didn't involve extraterrestrial biological entities, that they actually involved beings from this sustank or this kind of extensive underground civilization on Earth that, in, yes. that involved these non-humans. This grace, what they are, in fact, they are the most deep genetic modification of humans because this civilization manipulates our genetic structure for millennia, for millions of years. They create multiple hybrids, uh, to say correctly, not just hybrids, but genetically modified creatures based on us on humans and on our ancestors because they have also these hairy beings short dwarfs extremely short some of them to be able to penetrate very narrow underground passages just imagine these little tiny creatures uh, 30 centimeters in height half of the meter even shorter than the shortest grace they were seen in Malaysia and for many times and in different other places. So they have huge variety of these beings, but to mislead us, they say, oh, Greys are from that reticulum, Nordics are from Pleiades, these guys from Alpha Centauri, these guys from Aldebaran, Aldebaran is totally wrong place, just forget about it, it's huge red giant how you can imagine Earth like planet Sir. And most people, they don't know astronomy. They did never learn what Henry Draper's star catalog is, what Glee star catalog is. They just create these false addresses in space just on the, from the blue eye, just uh, out from the blue. Out from the blue, guys. Just wake up. What is they doing? How are they brainwashing us? And that must be as a space religion. Okay. Uh, we have different religions on our planet. And just imagine how it developed. Just learn the history of this subject. So... Yeah, yeah. And, Tom, I mean, I, I think uh, we can look at history. And, and you have... Uh, uh, you have the Egyptian culture that talks about the Sirius star being and beings yes. arriving from from, from yes. Sirius. Uh, you, you have like yes. uh, indigenous cultures that describe beings come from the from the Pleiades. Yes. So this is like part of uh, the ancient history of our planet. That there are many cultures that describe interactions oh. with beings that allegedly come from off world. So um, oh. I, I, I would I would agree that there's probably. Uh, that we have like a, a lot of off-world visitors, but and we also we have this kind of vast, extensive underground network of civilizations, sustained that that you've described. But I think we have both. I don't think it's just one. Uh, I would be glad if we have both. I would be so glad, Michael. You can't imagine how I want to believe. I am a believer myself. I want to believe in good space brothers that can fly here that can use wormholes but uh, i studied this story about sirius uh, sirius star just pay attention that this star alpha canis majoris is the brightest star so what happened in egypt in the ancient sumerian civilization gods arrived and god told all guy all oh, guys look there you see the brightest star on the sky. We're from there. They, they, that's where your gods live. So you must adder your gods and you must pay tribute to them and you must construct pyramids. Definitely, pyramids are inspired by aliens, no doubt. No doubt. They had contacts with aliens, Egypt, for sure, no doubt. Ancient Sumeria. And also, Ryan, look, guys, your godness, Zida, is from Cyrus. And look, guys, Pharaoh, your god, your god Osiris, is from Orion. Orion is just beautiful constellation, no doubt, just attracting human eye. So it is easy to say, your gods live there. 
Look at the sky. Don't look beneath. Just look there, not there. Be careful. And also this case about Pleiades. Yeah. I studied star maps. I studied 3D maps. Believe me. I know how the space, the real space looks like there. I did detailed 3D models of Pleiades. I studied all star systems there. Yes, so that's the probability. But together with that, we must also take into account the possibility that this nice constellation was chosen by the ancient gods just to display, just to show, oh guys, look there, your gods live there. Just pay tribute, behave yourself, be good guys, and respect your gods from the stars. That what was told to ancients, yes. But we don't have scientific evidence of Earth-like planets near Cyrus star. We don't have such, this evidence yet solely scientific from near Pleiades. You forget about the very Pleiades. They are very distant, very bright, very young, blue, all class and B spectral class stars from the point of astrophysics. Be attentive to details. I'm very attentive to details and I'm very careful in my conclusions. So I don't uh, reject this possibility, but this looks suspicious when gods arrive and say we are from the brightest stars. How that can be, guys? The brightest stars, they are too bright, they are too radioactive, too hot, and yet we have to find Earth-like planets there, and not yet, not yet. Just wait for these discoveries to prove that scientifically. Because pay attention to many planets were already found Earth-like, but not yet near Cyrus, not yet near Pleiades, and quite a few in Orion. So okay. just right. imagine well, huge well, interstellar distances, guys. All right. Huge. Well, um, I, I think maybe that we, we maybe have to agree to disagree on that one. I mean, I, I, I yeah, sure. I, I think let, that's probably nice. in that's the interest of in, in the interest of time, let's let's uh, tackle this other topic that I, I wanted to discuss uh, with you, and, and that is this uh, German document. It's kind of like a small book that was released, apparently from a witness, someone that had been a slave at the new berlin base in antarctica um yes. so yeah what, what do you what do you think of that was that is that a genuine account of someone that was a slave at this kind of like new berlin base uh yeah that's amazing evidence real amazing at first unexperienced look it looks like mad ravens of some crazy guy who's totally ill mentally and just created all this mad, crazy psychosis and total BS. But if you study that attentively, if you dig deeper, I personally and with my colleagues used to translation, we translated that from German to Russian. And I studied this, I'm still studying that document. And I must say that's amazing revelation, people. That's amazing, because uh, first of all, why do you think this is in, in Antarctica? This guy uh, who wrote this, Barabu Vedu, uh, with Indian name, first and second Indian name, he, he said that, I don't know myself, where is this? I'm not sure it's in Antarctica. By the way, I am sure this is not in Antarctica. No, because he stated, 
uh, that he used to live and even born there amid these people in this isolated society in this real breakaway society the whole civilization under rises in these caves and this vast underground spaces so what he told in this book that the majority of populations there are from northern europe just pay attention from scandinavian countries from germany and most are blue eyed with light skin and light hair just imagine if it could be in antarctica aliens could take from the nearest territories a lot of people from latin america from africa from australia but they took mainly northern europeans there and that means that underground colony is located closer to europe and what I firmly believe, it's under Greenland, guys. It's under apparently Eastern Greenland or Northern Greenland or under Northern Canada and Canadian Arctic, but definitely not under the South Pole region because it's too distant from Europe. And this new Berlin is apparently in the storefjord, as I um, discovered recently, the so-called Kangerlussuaq Glacier in eastern Greenland. And the trick, the trick is we have two fjords with the same name, Kangerlussuaq, which means long or big fjord. And uh, the fjord I'm talking about is in East Greenland. And in short, it is called Storfjord. And that's where the secret German Nazi base was created, the so-called Beaver Dam, or Der Beaver Dam, or uh, Boboja Tama in Polish. Uh, so it is a very remarkable place. And uh, some respected uh, researchers write about this, like my Polish colleague Robert K. Lesnikiewicz, uh, known Polish UFO researcher, ex-military guy, who is very competent in this, in Nazi Germany projects and this uh, subject about German UFO, secret bases, secret Nazi Wunderwaffe or the Wonder Weapon. So he wrote and other sources that indeed Germans had this base in Eastern Greenland. And when people talk solely and exclusively about Antarctica, they forget that in Greenland, you can find almost the same, the same glaciers, the same ices, the same remote places, the same slow density of population. Very little people live there. And it's much, it is much closer to Germany than Antarctica. You just cross the Atlantic Ocean by submarine and you're there in Greenland. Just imagine how long it might take to travel to Antarctica from Germany. Uh, I myself, uh, as experienced uh, PhD and university professor, I was teaching logistics in, the un in two universities. So I know what it is, uh, transport logistics. I know how expensive is that. I know how cargo is expensive and transportation. And also I used to teach transport logistics in two universities in Ukraine and in uh, Russia and Siberia as well. So believe me, guys, I know how difficult and how complicated are these tasks of transportation. So it is quite logically to assume that the main German breakaway civilization is positioned under the Greenland and not under Antarctica. And that's a um, brand new revelation from me to the UFO research community, because that's my point. 
I believe so, based on principles of logistics, uh, based on UFO evidence from the Northern Pole. Just uh, rem I remind you the case in 1960, when big UFO wave from the Northern Pole, from the direction of Greenland, almost caused caused World War III. It was big alarm in the United States, in North, North American rocket defense. This provoked this alarm. Just imagine what they could do to start the Third World War between US and the Soviet Union. Nazi Germans from Greenland bases, from the Arctic region, and so uh, we even removed viewed this base with my people, uh, the so-called Bieber Dam in Storfjord. We even find the entrance to this base. The entrance is marked by uh, this trident-like uh, sign on the rock, which looks like the trident sign in Nazca in South America. And this is the ancient room as well. So it looks like cracks in the rock, but I don't think so. I believe the secret entrance to the German old base and why it was called the Beaver Dam, because the Beaver, the Beaver Dam, because beavers, how they penetrate to their Mm, little home. They dive under the water and then they resurface inside the secluded closed room in their base, beavers. That's how this base was constructed. German submarines were diving and going underwater for a short distance and then resurfacing again in this cave inside this mountain. And that's how it works. And by the way, I found that this ancient base was accidentally discovered by Knud Rasmussen, the famous researcher of Greenland during his last seventh expedition called Thule Expedition. And uh, the second phase of this large enterprise had 150 people equipped with hydroplanes, motorboats, and etc. And at least four, maybe more Germans were a part of it the German intelligence as well. They knew this and they killed Knud Rasmussen, the famous researcher of Greenland, by poisoning him with a piece of meat. And he died from botulism officially. Uh, he just ate a bad piece of bad meat. So experienced polar researcher died from the piece of spoiled meat. Can you imagine that? He was very experienced. He organized many expeditions in Arctic and suddenly died and died exactly after this expedition. So this discovery was amazing. It was hidden by German intelligence and by Nazis and by SS and by Adenerbe. Since they came to power, German's Nazi party in 33, 1933, and Annenerbe Institute was created in 1935, and they kept this strictly under wraps, and they used this discovery to create a secret base there in Storfjord in East Greenland and Morovo. I found amazing facts about secret expedition in 1945 of U-390. Eight submarines there. Is Sorry, I had mean? my mute. I had my mute on. I just wanted to. I just wanted to kind of um, say that uh, I, you know, you you mentioned briefly already that there was an extensive network of tunnels under Norway, under Sweden, and that the Nazis were already using those. And so it's very possible that they built something in Greenland using this extensive underground system that the Allies wouldn't have seen because I think a lot of people would probably say, well, if the Germans built a huge underground civilization or bases in Greenland, uh, they would have been bombed to hell 
uh, by the Allied powers. But, of course, if they moved everything through these underground tunnel systems, then they could well have built it. And and I believe there has, has been some stories that have come out about um, underground, uh, German underground bases in in uh, Greenland and that we know the Americans have built some underground bases there. So there's definitely stuff happening there in Greenland. So, but I just want to come back to this document. So, um, you know, whether whether this New Berlin is there in Greenland or whether it's in Antarctica, uh, but but it does talk about uh, the it talks about advanced physics, mind control, psychic abilities, the the Montauk chair, the involvement of aliens. So, yeah, can you speak about the Montauk chair? I mean, can anyone get into one of these Montauk chairs and use it? Yes, absolutely. And they use a similar chair in this base in New Berlin called Berishevan chair. The strange name Berishevan or Berishevan. But this chair was very small in this uh, alien base under ISIS, which I believe is under Eastern Greenland. It was for dwarfs. The normal human being could hardly place himself or herself in this small chair, it was quite small, and evidently it wasn't for humans, it was for aliens. And they saw this little brown aliens that remotely look like greys, but definitely not greys, brown skinned um, aliens. They perceived them as gods, oh, the gods are coming, we must pray, and so on. So this definitely parallels the multiple stories about Montauk cheer. And I believe so. That is the case, probably is a similar technology. But this technology in this New Berlin base and the Greenland, I believe so, was used to travel outside my mind uh, to project uh, holographic images to manipulate this time and space and extremely advanced technologies virtual reality technologies um, brain brain scan and all these images could be projected it's completely different from all our television, internet, from all movies we have here. It, all of this is much more advanced because people can go crazy sitting all their life inside this underground bases, but they are high-tech bases. And to prevent them from going mad, this technology exists there. Of this amazing mantle trips, you can go anywhere, you can scan space, you can see so many things when you sit in this chair. And this huge colony was, wasn't created by Nazi Germans, uh, I mean, this new Berlin. And as far as I believe, and from the source, it is evident that it existed, existed, uh, and exists uh, till uh, today from 1700, from the early 18th century, for hundreds of years. Just imagine. And the construction was at that time frame approximately at uh, 1700-ish. Uh, they build this. And how they build this? They, they moved um, soil and they found this uh, hollow place and covered it by artificial substance like super strong plastic on top that is camouflaged to look like the top of glacier. And from remote, you can't differ it from natural formation of some any glaciers there. But in close proximity, it is evident that this is something different, but it definitely looks like ice, and, but it is super strong underneath. And it's almost on the surface, just under this layer, and the, the trans, almost transparent layer of super strong plastic. This is artificial biosphere created by aliens 
to contain human population, mostly from Europe of the Aryan race, and this uh, colony definitely has racism. They prevent um, black, uh, black, they don't like these people, they like white skinned and Aryan style and Aryan um, way, uh, Aryan looking people. And that parallels Nazi Germany a lot, but it is much more older colony for hundreds of years. Just imagine how old it is. And when Germans went there, they discovered underground passages and transportation ways and i know they used uh, egg shaped capsules traveling inside these long tunnels under greenland under eastern greenland from this the beaver dam base to the new berlin and they must be nearby uh, the beaver dam german top secret nazi ss base and this new berlin nearby and connected by extremely developed network of tunnels and by the way there's a place other place in greenland called germania land west of the cape of bismarck also very suspicious place in eastern greenland where i analyzed also satellite photography from google earth and i found very strange structures that look like apparently um indications of tunnels positioned close to the surface and the ice melts there along this uh, road routes that look like rods there and some are structures uh, very suspicious there under eastern greenland so when people talk only about antarctica that distracts people and mentality and population from Greenland. And that is very wise to distract people from real targets. Well, I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the how the uh, psychics were used in these programs, uh, the German program and also the Soviet program. I was uh, told, I interviewed a a contactee, Miriam Delacado, and, and she says that she uh, she was warned by her father about uh, the existence of uh, a Russian or a Soviet psychic program during the Second World War, and, and, and he warned her that if they ever approached you uh, because she she was very talented psychically, you know, don't join. And so uh, it, after 1988, when she had her uh, meetings, encounters with these tall Nordic-looking beings, she says she was approached by a, a Russian who, who wanted to recruit her to the Soviet Union to actually be part of a psychic program. of And, and he said that they were like 2,000 people that were part of that program. So, yeah, how, how, how significant, how important are psychics to the understanding, the development and reverse engineering of these advanced uh, flying saucer technologies? Yes, sure. Uh, I know that psychics are used long ago in Russia and the Soviet Union, they were also used starting from late 20s when the special laboratory was created inside NKVD system, the predecessor of the KGB, it was called NKVD, and this laboratory was under the leadership of Gleb Boki, the famous guy in the Soviet Union during even Stalin's times. And later it was organized, he was uh, killed uh, by official uh, order by the court and during the repressions in Stalin's time. And later it was World War II, big mass, and a um, lot of psychics were used, uh, a lot of them, like Wolf Messing uh, in the Soviet Union. He was very famous and he consulted even uh, party bosses of the Soviet Union and talk stars that even he, he even consulted Joseph Stalin, Joseph Stalin uh, at those times. 
and uh, evidently that's true i believe so and i know as a fact that several psychics remote viewers were taken to zhukovsky air base already in the years after 2000 here in this 21st century they took these guys to this underground hangar to this underground lab in zhukovsky southeast of moscow and they showed them these two uh, objects ufos they kept there recently recovered in the year 2000 and they told them guys look what can we do with them what you see inside uh, how they are made what is important and so on and so forth they had the whole list of questions to these psychics to help them to master this technology and to reveal uh, what is that and how they can use these recovered vehicles, uh, UFOs, I mean, crashed, recovered, uh, and kept in Zhukovsky uh, Air Base underground southeast uh, of Moscow. It's, it's very nearby to Moscow, and then they moved them to Chelyabinsk region to this nuclear center under the ground the main Soviet repository, uh, Russian repository today of the crashed recovered UFOs uh, and also other locations also used for that purpose. So that's standard practice to use psychics to, and their mental abilities, but you have to bear in mind that most uh, protected objects are very restricted. They are covered by protective layers because I used to work myself with psychics. I have some friends, uh, close friends of mine, who have these abilities and they work with them. And uh, they say sometimes, Anton, I can't penetrate because it's too protected. I can't see. It has multiple protection layers. You can't see this just uh, in front. You have to see it from beneath. You have to avoid this protection, uh, this mental screen that exists here uh, near that target. So that's not easy, but that's standard practice, yes. And there are many psych psychics and uh, even General Rogozin of the KGB was involved in this and also military unit, the famous unit um, 10,003 under the command of General uh, Alexei uh, Savin was also involved in that. And there's a huge book about this. I have read it and studied it in details in Russian, devoted to all this, to Stargate program in USA and to KGB mental spies and to this unit uh, 10003. It's very famous. It's now disbanded and it's no, it's no more secret in, the, in Russian. Even in today's Russia, it's no more secret. And the General Savin, uh, the famous Russian general, he gave many interviews about that, how they worked during the times of Boris Yeltsin, the first Russian president with his targets and with his uh, mental psychic abilities. And a lot of people were involved. And they even had direct contact with aliens. Just imagine. Uh, General Savin openly admitted that, yes, we had this meeting. Our people near Moscow, in the area of Moscow, they went to the landing site and they met humanoids there. And uh, that's true. And we have direct testimonies and it's open. It's no more classified, this aspect of interaction with aliens in Russia. And that's amazing, but that's true. And we can learn from this from internet, from open sources. And these people now give interviews. So, and he even wrote his book and he has a site and internet and a lot of sources. That's amazing revelation. It's modern disclosure. 
in present Russia. It just yeah. recently happened this disclosure. If you learn more, if you do your research, you will find really amazing facts about that. Well, I think uh, it really is a fascinating topic. I mean, this uh, relationship between psychics, uh, secret space programs, uh, the uh, involvement of different extraterrestrials and inner Earth beings, it is fascinating. I, I do plan to tackle that in my next webinar. Uh, so I, I want to thank you, Anton, uh, Dr. Anvilov, for, for really giving us a very extensive uh, discussion of your research into the whole a Nazi reverse engineering program, how that intersects with the Soviet program and the US program. So uh, any final words, anything you want to say to people uh, before we end this, uh, before we end the interview, uh, where do people go if they want to get in touch with you? Yes, uh, you can connect with me through Dr. Saller or you can find me in the internet. I'm open person and just people do your own research. Just don't believe everything you read in the internet. Be uh, sober, be open-minded, and always try to look for more and dig deeper, not just on surface. You always, we always must look in the essence of things and digging deeper and to finally reveal the shocking truth. And that's revelation. Real well, revelation, I must say, guys. Well, thank you, Anton. Welcome. You're always welcome. I'm so glad to talk to you every time. Pleasure to have you on ExoPolitics today. You have been listening to ExoPolitics today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.